voice of discovery and sharing. The Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. So we have invited a very special、uh, writer in our house.、Uh, her name is Wang Xiulin, and she is a freelance writer, and she's been writing for more than 25 years, especially on the travel and environment. So let's say good morning to her. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> How are you? I'm fine. I am. Yeah,、good. I'm good. Thank you. So,、uh, could you briefly、uh, introduce yourself? I mean, I've、uh, just introduced you shortly, but you can elaborate more on what you've been doing so far. Yes, I'm a、uh, well, as you mentioned in your introduction, I'm a、mm-hmm. um, freelance writer, and I、uh, got my roots in writing professionally in journalism.、Mm-hmm. And I worked in Singapore, where I got excellent training.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I actually didn't do a mass communication course. I didn't do a journalism course. So what did you study? <laughs>、uh, well, I did an arts degree, and it、oh. was in,、uh, one of my majors was English, as in literature and you know、uh, that sort of thing. And、uh, my second major was actually economics. Wow. Yeah, but I. I came out and looked for jobs that were available at that time,、mm-hmm. and got into journalism. If you say, if you can say, you know, by chance. But、uh, I've been very lucky. I've had really excellent trainers, and that has set me on a path that I have been doing for、uh, over two decades now.、Mm-hmm. So, so、um, that happened in Singapore. Yes, that、mm-hmm. happened in Singapore. My first job was in Singapore, and I worked in a trade、uh, publishing firm, which meant、uh, that I was dealing with specialist magazines that went to certain trades, and the. Trades were actually broadcasting and telecommunications, right? <laughs> Very technical areas, yeah. But I wanted to become a journalist,、oh, so、right. I came back to Malaysia and I worked for the Star for a while, yeah. And that that got me my, you know, got my reporting,、uh, you know,、um, got me into reporting,、mm-hmm. and, you know, and、uh, and that actually actually got me into environmental writing、mm-hmm. because. Is, I think it continues to be about the only、uh, publication that focuses very, very seriously on、mm-hmm. the environment.、Mm-hmm. Uh, so I、um, worked for the Star for about three and a half years, and then I came out to become a freelance writer. And I've been working on all sorts of media since then.、Mm-hmm. Uh, I've worked on books, I've worked on brochures, I've done reports. I do stuff for all sorts of clients, from government to private sector. And then, of course, when the dot com boom happened,、mm-hmm. like the original dot com boom. In 2000,、right. I went up to Hong Kong,、right. and I worked there、uh, for a while、uh, to create content for an international、uh, portal,、mm-hmm. and that was very interesting.、Uh, and of course, with boom and bust of the the dot com,、uh, that happened to my website、uh, <laughs> up there.、Uh, it was、um, it was a very interesting experience, you know. And as as always, I think people sort of jumped into the internet thinking they could make a lot of money out、mm-hmm. of that, and that failed because you need. You know what they call the bricks and mortar experience behind it、Correct. as well. Correct.、Yeah? Mm-hmm. So now, of course,、uh, things have、uh, developed. They've matured, and、um, I continue to be interested in、uh, online、uh, writing. So、um, yeah, basically just doing all sorts of, of of things, even in broadcast as well. I've worked on films and、uh, documentaries and stuff、oh, like、nice. that as well. Oh, nice! Right. So kind of like a bit of anything and everything. <laughs> yeah. And、uh, yeah, so so that's where I am at the moment. It sounds very dynamic <laughs> what you've been doing so far, other than writing stuff, and then your focus is mainly on traveling and also environmental issues, I will say. But other than that, you mentioned shortly you also did documentary and you also did the broadcasting. But in Malaysia, how is it like to be a freelance writer in Malaysia? Is it easy or how is the perception? I think、uh, the important thing is to do good work、mm-hmm. uh, and create very good relationships and、uh, deliver on time. I think those are my three mantras, if you like. I see. And at the end, people. I think everybody needs writers. I think I'm very lucky to be in this、uh, field,、mm-hmm. and because I'm flexible and I'm curious about anything and everything,、mm-hmm. I've opened up myself to all sorts of media. And but at the end of the day, I think if you've got strong basics, you've got a good work ethic,、uh, I think there will be jobs. Mm-hmm. Well,、um, the, in terms of talking about jobs, right?、Uh, especially for writers. I mean, before, of course, our older generation they used to buy books from bookshops and read, f- have a physical copies. But now there is a transition from physical copies to online platforms. How is it like for freelancer writers like you to to have a, this transition sort of period? Do you tend to go to the online platforms more nowadays? Well, I think that、uh, print is 
not going to die out any time, mm-hmm. despite what some people say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, even with e-readers and mm-hmm. e-books and stuff like that. Uh, but of course, everybody's online now. Mm-hmm. Everybody reads. Like I read only online news, for mm-hmm. instance. I don't buy newspapers Papers, anymore. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which is b- a bit sad. <laughs> but uh, um, I think. Uh, Knowing and seeing where the trend is now, uh, and and uh, you know people reading more and more, not just online, but reading mobile devices. You know, not even reading stuff on desktop mm-hmm. anymore. Uh, you you kind of have to, as a freelancer and you know somebody who who runs their own business, um, I have to keep up with what's what what I think the the, the trends are going to be. Mm-hmm. So while books will continue to be important, mm-hmm. and I will and I love writing books, mm-hmm. um, I have. Uh, decided to go very seriously again into this whole dot com thing if you like. <laughs> I was very lucky to be based in Germany for a short while mm-hmm. between 2008 and 2012. Right. Yeah. And um, I didn't intend to uh, basically study Germany. I, I was in Berlin, mm-hmm. which is a great, great city. But what I did end up doing was taking a lot of photographs mm-hmm. and taking a lot of notes and really exploring the city. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the four years, I have like thousands of photographs and a lot and a lot of material about different aspects of Germany, including the environmental movement right you know, what's what's been happening there and as a result of that and also wanting to go back into this whole thing um, about uh, uh, online con- producing online content uh, I created a website mm-hmm. uh, which I've been working on for the last one year mm-hmm. uh, which is um, uh, a combination of text and images mm-hmm and uh, creating different stories using an online platform Mm -hmm. and I I love it because it's open like uh, working with books working with articles you're always limited by space right Whereas, well, online, like anything and everything is literally possible. Yep. So I, that's what I did um, for the last one year is to really look at what the medium it was able to to allow me, and and I love it. I have to say, I really, really love writing online, mm-hmm. and um, the idea really also is a little bit to go against social media. Mm. I know Facebook uh, provides a very, very convenient, uh, ready-made platform yep. for people to express themselves. Uh, but I wanted to go a little bit against them and see, uh, you know, with, with my experience as a professional writer, what I could do with uh, breaking away from, uh, you know, conforming to, uh, you know, Facebook and all that. It's, it's a little bit like a, a print as well. You mm-hmm. know, it's like it's almost like a newspaper. So mm-hmm. you have to write, for example, 800 words, and mm-hmm. that's all the space they will give you. Right. And Facebook kind of constrains you a little bit as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah. So I, th- you know, I, th- I've just been experimenting with this website for the last. Um, one year. So with this limitless space that you have eh, and then you can do like you can upload pictures and articles and wordings or you can basically do whatever you want yeah. and that it is very heavily related to blogs. Blogs basically you can just do whatever you want. You can express yourself on any issues, any of your interest. So um we are talking about environment issue and also in the conjunction with the CLEF coming up very soon. Uh, you will be holding a workshop on uh, green blogs. So could you elaborate more on that? What's green blogs all about? Mm-hmm. Sure. Uh, well, as you rightly said, uh, a blog basically is basically a space mm-hmm. online where you can write about anything and everything. Uh, choosing to write about uh, green issues or environmental issues is just one of the areas mm-hmm. that uh, people passionate about doing something about mm-hmm. it environment can do. Um, so the idea for the blog came about because Yasmin from uh, from Ecolites, Clef, yeah, mm-hmm. who's, who's running Clef, mm-hmm. uh, approached me to do something on uh, environmental storytelling. Right. And after discussion, I thought let's let's go blog because again the target is young people, so mm-hmm. we're targeting people between the ages of 17 and 24, and really that's your medium. Mm-hmm. That's basically uh, your newspaper, your right. TV, your mm-hmm. everything, you know. And uh, so let's let's look at blog. And I think a lot of young people post, I mean, they're active on Facebook. I'm sure a lot of them actually are bloggers. Uh, uh, but let's let's look at this specific thing in conjunction with um, the film festival, sure. uh, whose theme is environment. Mm-hmm. And let's, let's see if we can draw young people who are interested and passionate about the environment, mm-hmm. who are passionate about writing mm-hmm. and who have writing skills to come in and... Um, Create blogs or look at look at blogs in a very detailed way with someone uh, with a lot of experience uh, writing. Right. 
So um, I guess my approach is uh, going back to basics. Mm -hmm. um, what actually makes good writing? If you write well, and I, uh, you know, earlier on before the, the the broadcast, we were talking about how do you, you know, the amount of noise there is. Right. You you have a platform mm -hmm. that is. Uh, theoretically open to the world, yep. how do you make your little voice heard mm -hmm. above all the noise that's out there? Mm -hmm. And one of the keys to that is good writing. Mm -hmm. If you if you're writing a blog, a blog can of course just be um, video, mm -hmm. or it can be just images. Mm -hmm. um, using Instagram, using a different platform, one of the many platforms that are available. Um, but if you produce really good stuff. Mm -hmm. People will want to follow you. They will want to retweet, right. or they will want to, you know, spread the word, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. And that's what um, I, that's the approach that I've decided to take is to go back to basics and look at um, the tools, or give, give, you know, help give some tools that can um, help a person create something really good. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really good uh, advice here. But when I think about the writing, it's also a form of an art because it's not just that you can, just because you can speak a language or just because you can write doesn't mean that you can produce a good article. You, it's a sort of art that you need to just have a first draft, then you have to amend it over and over again, make sure it's attractive enough for readers to read and comprehend what you write after all. But when it comes to uh, writing on certain topics, and we're talking about environmental issues, uh, uh, generally, not many people out there in public, they, are, they may not be interested in the environmental issues. So let them, having them read your article is another challenging as well. So could you elaborate more on that? Like how bloggers can attract their articles uh, for readers to read their own the, uh, site or website or blogs? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay, so there's, there's maybe two mm -hmm. um, ways of looking at this. Well, the first one is the creation of really right. good content. And as you said, some people have it. Some people are natural born writers, yeah. just like some people are very, very good visually, and some people are very good at, at talking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so if you have a natural ability, then you're really lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, basically what the workshop will aim to do is to try and hone that and uh, just give you tools. Right, yeah. okay. I think everybody needs tools. Um, even I continue to, uh, you know... Uh, look out for different ways to write better, uh, to improve my writing, mm -hmm. to look at a medium and how to use that medium to the best of my ability in order to convey um, a message mm -hmm. or to write a story mm -hmm. or to share something that I feel that I would like to share. Right. Um, so the workshop looks at uh, providing some tools so that if you, even if you are a very good writer, you can come along and go back to basics. Right. Yeah, and just see, because I think people with natural ability kind of don't think about it. They just write, and then it just comes out. Because really they rely on their natural ability. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know? But um, but with the tools, people who are interested in writing, mm -hmm. um, but that, you know, feel that they don't know enough, can mm -hmm. also use these tools as building blocks. Right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I'm not promising to make them brilliant writers in <laughs> two hours, but I'm I'm hopeful that this will be a good start, mm -hmm. and uh, just some really basic building blocks that actually I continue to use on a daily basis mm -hmm. as a writer today. Mm -hmm. Um, now that's one so get, getting really good content mm -hmm. um, how do you get your message out I think is um, don't try and be well one of the other things I'm going to try and do is to help people be clear about what they want to right. say okay. so uh, there's no point saying I want to write about the environment okay what aspect of the environment exactly yeah. oh I want to save the animals <laughs> oh okay that's a good point so how do you want to save the, an right. the animals? You know, so it's basically asking questions like that and helping people sort of hone in on what it is they're really interested in. Mm. You know? Or you could do a, a collective. You could do like you join up with three other people, your good friends who are like really passionate about um, a, a topic, mm -hmm. and and let's do something. Let's start a blog, and then you have different voices, you know. And if you've got um, full time jobs, or if you're busy studying, you're still a student, and you're at university, um, then then you kind of spread the load a little bit mm -hmm. as well, you know. So there's again very different ways of um, approaching g getting something out, getting a blog done, you know. Um, uh, and then, of course, if you want to reach out to a lot of people, again, there's many different ways of doing it. You could uh, contact an organization, for example, like Eco Night. Right. Um, I hope I'm not putting Yasmin in the spot <laughs> here. But you could look at different organizations like sure. even newspapers mm -hmm. uh, or online, uh, I call them newspapers, like, uh, online uh, news outlets, you mm -hmm. know. 
um, and see if they might be interested in uh, letting you ride on them you know uh, now as a, you know as we, we had talked about the kind of openness of the internet mm-hmm. allows for so many different ways of um, collaborating right of uh, sharing mm-hmm. you know and of um, yeah, just try you know it's basically just try for sure and you don't have to limit yourself to Malaysia <laughs> <laughs> that's the fantastic thing about going online all right well I'm having conversation with uh, Wang Siu Lin so we'll be uh, com- uh, coming back after this short break so stay tuned the Durian Heat, bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia. Welcome back to Durian ASEAN, the voice of discovery and sharing. So I've been speaking with Wang Siu Lin, and she's a freelance writer for 25 years, and especially featuring on the traveling and environmental issues. So she's got a huge and a very dynamic experience when it comes to writing. And of course, in the conjunction with the CLEF in the coming month in October, she'll be uh, holding a workshop for two hours. So please catch up this workshop coming up. We'll be talking about this workshop later on. But right now, we're going to come back to her and perhaps let her share her experiences uh, being a writer internationally. (laughs) So let's um, come back to our nation, Malaysia. In Malaysia, generally, uh, how how many people or in terms of population do people care about environmental issues? And then when articles are produced, what are the feedbacks so far? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, that's a tricky question Mm -hmm. uh, to try and answer. Do people care about the environment? Yes, I think in the sense that, um, well, uh, for me, the environment is always linked up to, um, especially in countries like Malaysia, development. Right. So it's very hard to isolate. Um, so do people care about the way the country is developed? I think that certainly in the last generation, uh, maybe yeah, in the 80s, in the 90s, mm-hmm. in the early 2000s, two th- yeah, the 2000s were the big the, was 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 when the, there was a big spurt of growth in Malaysia. And uh, so it was very much about, you know, being as good as developed nations. We continue to have that aspiration. Um, it, the thing is that now I think people are a lot more aware of balancing that. I see. Which is why terms like sustainability are right. so hot at the yes. moment. Yes. Um, the reason I'm asking you is because, okay, for example, um, in Japan and in Korea, or even other developed countries in the European countries, people have been practicing in terms of saving environments. For example, even dividing trash bins already. It's a part of their lives. But in Malaysia, it just recently it's implemented and people are just about to practice all that. So the, the culture is not there yet. So that's what I'm asking in terms of writers when you write articles and uh, related to environments, how are the feedbacks so far and um, how do people give you the opinions based on the articles that you've produced? Mm-hmm. I guess uh, in terms of public um, general uh, articles that target the public, mm-hmm. If you look at the range of publications that are available, Mm -hmm. um, the Star continues to be about the only newspaper Mm -hmm. that covers environment on a very serious level. They have a special section. They have a special editor whom whom I have a lot of respect for. uh, And every Tuesday, there's going to be a a massive article, a lead article in in their feature section on Mm -hmm. it, as well as a whole series of different articles. But you can see other publications, whether online or not, don't really it sort of takes uh, you know take environment seriously if you like mm, importance of it you mean yeah mm-hmm. I think so mm-hmm. I think um, if so if you're looking at the push factor mm-hmm. uh, there certainly isn't enough All right. I think in, in Malaysia mm-hmm. amongst uh, Malaysian publications whether online or in print um, having said that uh you know, all this information is available online mm-hmm. from other countries. Mm-hmm. Um, in Japan, in Korea, there's there's a huge push, you mm-hmm. know, for sustainable uh, consumption, sustainable mm-hmm. development, and all the rest of it. Um, I think in yeah. Why am I struggling to answer this question? <laughs> I think on the one hand, if you look at the older generation. Um, 
people maybe in their 70s and 80s. Right. They came from a kind of lifestyle that mm-hmm. was not so consumption-based. All right. Right? And, you know, con- consumerism is actually one of the big uh, drivers for uh, pollution, for the use of resources, uh, destruction of forests, and so on and so forth, you know. And so we're looking at maybe, you know, I guess uh, within maybe two generations, right. if you like, mm-hmm. yeah, there's been a huge change mm-hmm. in the way Malaysians live their lives. Oh, that's very true, yes. At the same time, mm-hmm. those who are in their 70s and 80s, uh, I, well, my parents, for example, my father, um, a little bit continues to live like, um, you know, it's, it's kind of this war mentality. Right, like, okay, you know, where yeah. He, he saves everything. He, he recycles. Mm-hmm. He doesn't just, he composts. You know, he does all these things and, mm-hmm. you know, he's he's still alive and he's, you know, he's the way he lives is an example to, to me, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, and um, uh, so I think that generation is still there. I think those values mm-hmm. are still around to a certain extent, yeah. Uh, so this, this whole thing about recycling, uh, you know, but people don't even bother recycling. Now, plastic bags are, are disallowed in uh, supermarkets only one day a week, mm-hmm. you know, stuff like that. Um, it, it kind of is a little bit of a reminder, I guess, of the values that we... That our, for, you know, our like my father's mm-hmm. generation had, and continue to have, you know. So, um, you know, things like recycling and 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 reduce, you know, it's always reduce before you reuse, yep. you know. Uh, yep. So, so reduce consumerism, reduce the use of resources, and all that sort of thing, are um, maybe just reminders. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not sure. All maybe, right. maybe people in their 20s and all that, they, they just don't, they're so distant from that, those values mm-hmm. that uh, maybe it is time that we need to push extra hard mm-hmm. uh, as uh, communicators, as writers, uh, as newspapers, as publications, that we need to push those things through uh, a lot more. And and maybe say, you know, just go and, go and talk to your, your, your grandfather. Right. Or go and talk to your grandmother. Because it's very interesting when I see the patterns in younger generation and older generation, if I need to make a comparison between those two, is of course we can take examples from older generation, learn from them, but at the same time we are pretty much pampered by all those uh, society that if we, we don't do it somebody will do it and then we are not the only one and we see people just throwing treasures anyways so me just doing it wouldn't harm the environment that much that's the mindset that the younger generation usually do have so it is very important to have the all those awareness or even read, reading about the articles and to make sure that what we have been doing to the environment positively or negatively so that's when I asked you the question of what is your thoughts and as a writer in Malaysia generally so um, in terms of getting feedbacks from audience when you produce articles could you share any um, fun experiences or any memorable experiences that you, you, you would love to share with our listeners yeah, well, I, I'm I'm a little bit older than you are, <laughs> and I, you know I used to, to to write for the Star. I, mm-hmm. I I started writing before social. This thing called right. social media came into being. <laughs> Correct. And uh, uh, you know we used to just write in the dark, mm-hmm. and uh, not really know what you know. Uh, people never bothered writing and, and telling I see. us you know how okay. they felt about anything. So mm-hmm. it's a, journalism as a whole has changed. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's more like two way communication for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. things have changed completely, and and everybody can be a journalist mm-hmm. now, really. Which is also the other thing that's new and that's different. Mm-hmm. You know? Correct. Now, uh, is there necessarily uh, better quality mm-hmm. writing now? Uh, I'm not sure because sometimes you look through. Uh, I think that this the whole thing about uh, being allowed to be anonymous when you <laughs> post comments might not necessarily be such a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> so does that make the the quality having instant feedback? Um, does that necessarily Necessarily make the writing any more, you know, better quality. Right. I'm not so okay. sure about that. I mm. really am not. So, do uh, you know? Um, I guess the way I measure how effective I am mm-hmm. is is the ability to get jobs. <laughs> Touch wood. <laughs> 
Uh, and if people like uh, my writing um, and people will publish my writing and I can get jobs, then I'm assuming I'm 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 barking up the right tree. <laughs> well, uh, then let's move on to your experience more specifically. So when you think about environment, it's really huge topic. Like you mentioned about animals, saving animals, or even save environment, trees, forest, deforestation, and endless. What is your specific topic so far and you've been focusing on? I'm uh, very focused on conservation. Mm-hmm. That's something that has interested me almost from the time I started writing about the environment. Uh, But what, what made you interested in the conservation from the first place? Well, <laughs> as a young, as a junior journalist in the Star, I think right. I was a bit lost when I first joined the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think a, a few months after I began, I met a very, very persuasive and very charming communications person mm-hmm. from uh, WWF. Oh, right. He's no longer there now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and he got me really excited about the environment. Oh, and that's about interesting. Conservation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think meeting people and being and going to talks and be exposing yourself to, to different sorts of people mm-hmm. is a really key thing to getting people interested. I totally interested. agree you with that. Yeah, for sure. Yes. So y- while you may be able to persuade people with your writing or with your, your radio broadcast or with good programs and all the rest of it, when you meet people, I mm-hmm. think you know that that actually tends to be a For huge sure. influence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so because of that, uh, and and he was just really keen to push all the programs that oh. WWF had. <laughs> and here was this this kind of like naive journalist who was like a little bit lost and wanting something to mm-hmm. write about. Um, it really worked. <laughs> So I, I ended up giving uh, giving them quite a lot of publicity, and oh, from wow. them I started looking. At, I was introduced to the whole NGO movement, activism, and all the rest of it. And uh, conservation remains uh, a very big thing for me, mm-hmm. which is why the the big issue now, which is climate change. Yep. Um, I'm I, I I I'm not saying that I'm not so into it uh, because it it affects conservation. It right. affects the forest, it, uh, species loss, and yep. all the rest of it at the end of the day, you know. Uh, and as you said, it's not only a big, big um, uh, uh, area. Yep. Environment is mm-hmm. not just a big area. It's also very intricately tied. Mm-hmm. And earlier on, I had mentioned uh, when you talk about environment, you talk about development, you have to talk about it on in the same Correct. Breath, you know, because it's humans and nature, mm-hmm. you know, and that human impact on nature mm-hmm. and nature's impact on humans through Huge disasters like the tsunami or earthquakes yep. and stuff like that. Yeah, mm-hmm. so so it's it's this very complex, intricate link. Mm-hmm. You know? So um, in by saying that I'm interested in conservation doesn't mean that I'm not interested in in climate change. Right. Uh, I can't afford to be, mm-hmm. you know, because I have to understand how all these things are linked. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm uh, you know, at the same time I mentioned consumerism earlier on, and that's also tied to um, conservation, mm-hmm. because at the end, what you consume, uh, and we, we we talk about things like shark's fin, the consumption right. of shark's fin yep. has a direct impact on the numbers of sharks that are in the For oceans. For sure, yes, yeah. mm-hmm. things like that. Mm, that's very interesting. Then, how about your experience in Germany? I mean, you've talked. About very shortly before in the introduction, that uh, you lived in Berlin, and of course you had hundreds or thousands of photos there for four years. So, um, um, how how was your experience basically in Germany, and what's their concern over there environmentally? Okay, uh, yeah, I did try to uh, learn a little bit uh, about uh, the environmental movement and 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 how the Germans uh, sort of. Uh, approach envi- mm-hmm. the environment and environmental issues. You can see that they are more advanced in terms of uh, things like recycling, okay. you know, uh, in terms of green buildings, mm-hmm. in terms of energy use. Um, uh, that that really uh, w- was what I went to look for, and mm-hmm. I actually found it. Uh, uh, and it's it's very interesting the sort of initiatives they have, and and government plays such a big role okay. in helping to push uh, environmentalism there. So, for example, uh, and they they are sometimes sort of laughed. The Germans are sometimes laughed at for doing this. If you look at mineral water bottles mm-hmm. in Germany, they have a little barcode mm-hmm. which you can actually. Um, and when you bring this, these bottles to a supermarket, there are actually little slots there, uh-huh. and you put your mineral water bottles there, uh-huh. and a little receipt will come out, and you actually get paid 
for recycling your your mineral water. Right. So that's in every supermarket in Germany. Oh wow, that's interesting. That is so, it's so great, you know, and that's why you never see any empty mineral water bottles lying around in parks or in rubbish bins. That's very smart. <laughs> Everybody recycles them oh. because even if you get like two cents a, a bottle or whatever, you can use that, and then you can buy something in the supermarket. For and sure. So I would totally not throw away, you know, mineral water bottles. So mm-hmm. things like that. But you need government. Uh, uh, intervention. Mm-hmm. You need corporate intervention. You mm-hmm. need, like, for example, the supermarkets to buy into this whole thing. And you need the recyclers mm-hmm. to um, to also say yes, we will pay mm-hmm. people to collect these these bottles for us. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, so it's it's very holistic over there, which is fantastic. Mm-hmm. And of course, the other big thing um, that I looked at. Um, was the the whole nuclear All right. movement. Okay. And the environmental movement in Germany began out of protests against uh, oh. the, the, the mm-hmm. use of uh, nuclear, nuclear power mm-hmm. in, in, in Germany. Mm-hmm. And I find it very interesting uh, that in Malaysia, you know, because of the... The um, am I allowed to say Linas? <laughs> yes, please go ahead. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because of the the Linas uh, facility in right. in, in uh, Pahang, uh, that that this movement not only grew but grew to become a political movement mm-hmm. because the the activists who were involved in uh, protesting the Linas um, facilities actually stood for election mm-hmm. in the last election. Mm-hmm. So I find it a very interesting parallel and. Uh, um, and it's certainly in Germany, it has gotten to the stage where uh, waste is transported back. It's it's kind of like um, processed in France. Mm. Nuclear waste is processed in France, and Germany until today have not found a place to store their nuclear waste. Right. Wow. You know? And they've got I don't know X number of nuclear power stations and and all the rest of it, and nobody wants it in their backyard. <laughs> so they have these so-called temporary areas, you know. Temporary areas. Temporary okay. Areas, <laughs> you know? Uh, and and the the waste has to be transported by railway track oh. to um, a town and then transported onto trucks through this most beautiful. And we were actually there recently uh, in this area uh, to to uh, to to where the the waste the temporary waste facility is, you know. And the trucks have to go on roads through villages and past rivers and uh, and all that. It's it's just ridiculous. So you think like on the one hand you have Things, for example, like the the, the um, mineral water recycling, yep. uh, you know, idea or program, which is fantastic. And on the other hand, you have this enormous, dang- enormously dangerous uh, thing exactly. called nuclear waste, yeah. which they don't actually know what to do with. Oh no. So if Germany can't figure out a way of doing it, you know, I can't imagine there's been a lot of talk of, of, of bringing nuclear power to Malaysia. So you're saying it's until now they're still figuring out. <laughs> because people are people are saying, you know, shut down the, the, the nuclear facilities in mm. Germany, you know, and, and every time uh, this waste is brought back into Germany, uh-huh. there's, there's all this protest lined up, you know, even the, the farmers are involved in it, they'll use their tractors and they'll block the road so that the trucks can't go past, you know, and people will chain themselves to the railway tracks. I mean, it's phenomenal. And it's not just these so-called tree huggers. Uh-huh. They're doctors, there are politicians, right. you know, there are there are, there are housewives, there are students, you know, there are every everybody is involved in this anti nuclear. So process. is it more like the conflict between those people and also the government? And how is the government approaching to all these problems at the moment? Well, you know, they they already committed to nuclear waste and I think after Fukushima mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it scared them so much. All right. There was already so much pressure, uh, mm. you know, against the use of nuclear power that they decided, okay, no more. We're going to shut down okay. uh, uh, nuclear uh, power stations by a certain year. I forget now what the I year see. is, mm-hmm. but they actually have committed to a year. And of course, it's a big problem now because there's a lot of compensation that needs to be paid out mm. to these energy companies. Mm-hmm. And also, does Germany have enough power to uh, replace the, the the power that's being generated by the nuclear facility? Mm-hmm. even though it's a very long rollout. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that they're looking at in, in Germany uh, was wind power. and But, you know, the coast is up in the north and a lot of factories and stuff are down south. Right. How are you going to pipe the exactly. <laughs> yeah, energy link them together. from wind power yeah. or, you know, uh, using um, uh, wave power, right? Mm-hmm. How are you going to pipe it all the way down? Mm-hmm. So you need to build lines, power lines. And then there's another big issue that's like, again, not in my backyard, you know. Mm-hmm. I don't want these ugly lines lines running through this pristine, you know, countryside that I've chosen to live in and yeah. all that. So it's always negotiation, mm-hmm. all the time, you know. 
and 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 I, I guess this is the the way that Malaysia and maybe ASEAN also has to go through. You, you mm-hmm. have to constantly negotiate and you have to adapt, and, and there's going to be a lot of resistance, whether from government or from the local people sure, or yeah. organizations or companies or whatever, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, it has to be it has to be taken one step at a time, mm-hmm. I guess. And, and you need you need political will. Mm-hmm. You need political will, and you really need um, y- y- grassroots um, For sure. movements as well. Mm-hmm. Because it's a combination of everything. It's quite complex. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Well, coming back to Malaysia, we've been having this problem called haze. Um, air pollution level is really, really bad at the moment. But then when you look at the, the government approach and also public, there are a f- uh, quite a number of activists who are against the haze and they're asking for uh, approach, more better approach uh, from the government. What's your thought in this um, from the Malaysian perspectives? Because it doesn't look like haze is going away anytime soon and it's coming from Indonesia and Singapore is also heavily affected and of course public schools are closed from today. In, in Malaysia, um, just a couple of weeks ago, the government announced yes, public schools will be closed. But other than that, wh- what do you see? Uh, any other approaches from the government side? It, it is a very tricky situation because, mm-hmm. and, and now we come to ASEAN, uh, because of the policy of non-interference. Right. Um, which all the governments have agreed to. Uh, and uh, until last year, I think Singapore just got really fed up mm-hmm, because the mm-hmm. haze was really bad yep. last year in Singapore. Uh, we Malaysians have the capacity of accepting a lot of things, <laughs> including not having good air to breathe, including not ha- you know being able to send your kids to school. Yeah, and, uh, exactly. We put up with mm-hmm. a lot. We are very patient people, you know. High tolerance level. Very high <laughs> tolerance level, exactly. So I guess the only thing that can be done uh, from the, the perspective of the public is just write to your MPs, mm-hmm. write to your aduns, and and hassle them and mm-hmm. and just get them to do something, you know, just like yeah, this is where, uh, you know, political consciousness has to be there amongst mm, the, the ordinary course. Malaysians as well. What can the government do? It's it's hard. Uh, apparently, I just heard on the radio that the they've been trying, I think I was it, um, I forget now, one of our ministers was supposed to meet one of the ministers in Indonesia and it's been postponed twice mm-hmm. because of the haze. Yep. So it's so bad. It's yeah. crazy. You yeah. Know? It's it's absolutely crazy. And it's very hard. What we can do, what can, what could the government do? They could, they've already offered to send firefighting crews yeah. over. They've offered to land planes every year. That's, that's something that's being done. But one of the, uh, the one of the root causes of the haze mm-hmm. is, um, the burning of peat. Mm-hmm. And perhaps we could send or offer to send, whether it's NGOs or or, 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 or government or whoever, to send expertise over to, to try and sort out um, the proper management of peat. Mm-hmm. When you drain peat and when you um, plant on peat mm-hmm. and you don't manage water levels properly, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have spontaneous bur- fires coming up. You're going to have fires burning underground. You're going to have this thick choking smoke, mm-hmm. which is then blown all over the place. I mean, Indonesians are suffering as well. Yeah, you know? for so sure. They're not, they're not happy mm-hmm. either, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and But it's a very complex thing. It's very, very complex. Right. So what can we do here? Um, perhaps the other thing we could do is to look out for open burning here in Malaysia. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that w- has been happening in the past as well, uh, just reading news reports and everything, is that our own peat is also burning. Right. So we have to like look after, you know, our own, you know, sort For of sure. like, yeah, fire starters or the management of our own peatlands and stuff like that. Mm. And again, just the normal person or, or any blogger or anybody who's passionate about this kind of thing, start a blog, mm. start a Facebook uh, page, start um, a, a group or whatever and have people just discussing this, uh, you know, and, and taking some action um, through activism or whatever. You know? In addition to that, um, I strongly believe in education, educating public public is another one and with this uh, the writing uh, the having uh, workshops for this club is very important to educate even though it's just a short while a couple of hours you'll be able to educate a number of people there so I uh, will take another short break when we come back we'll focus on the workshop at CLEF The Durian Heat bringing big ideas and critical opinions in Southeast Asia Welcome back to Driana Asian, the voice of discovery and sharing. And I've been speaking with Wang Sui Lin. She is a freelance uh, writer for 25 years, especially on travel and environment. So Sui Lin, can you elaborate your workshop at CLEF uh, in October? Sure, Grace. 
Um, all the details about the workshop are available on the CLEF website. Mm-hmm. So you just go to um, http back, back, um, colon backslash backslash mm-hmm. ecofilmfest.my you go to attractions and the, all the bookshops will be listed there so you just go to the one which says green blogging mm-hmm. and uh, all the information will be there the workshop is going to be held on Sunday the 18th of October uh, from 9.30 mm-hmm. to 12 uh, and it will be at the white box at Publica uh, you can also register from that page mm-hmm. and I think they're charging a flat fee of 50 ringgit per yep. participant. Mm-hmm. And it will be uh, about 2 hours and 15 minutes. And uh, just bring along your own smartphone or iPad, something that you're you're happy to type into. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, basically, yeah, the workshop will cover very basic stuff, as I said. Right. You know, I, I, I always like to go back to basics. Basic, basic, basic yeah. yeah. And even if um, I'm hoping to attract people who are good at writing, mm-hmm. um, preferably English, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to turn anybody who's good at writing in Malay or in Mandarin. Right. But the workshop will be conducted in English. Mm-hmm. Yeah? So uh, the basics I'll be going back to would be what is blogging, um, how to find and develop your voice, um, telling to, telling a story. I'm going to give some basic building blocks, and uh, and then I'm just you're actually going to get a chance. Participants are actually going to get a chance to go out and do a story, mm-hmm. write a blog, just a little one, you know. But at least you've got the practical experience of doing that, and it's also a way to contribute to and be part of the larger cleft. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of stuff is happening, workshops and um, performances as well as the films, and uh, there's going to be a green market there as well. Right. So, um, and then at the end, we'll just review and share. Mm, it's very interesting. And then uh, I can package this one as a green blog one-on-one uh, session with um, Wong Suilin here at that's, CLEF. That's it, exactly. Yes. <laughs> well, but then I'm sure people will feel that, oh, there should be another session because they just touch on the back to basic, all this basic stuff foundation, which is very important. But would you like to plan another session if, I mean, of course, it will go really successfully. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, I'm always happy to to develop and to work, uh, especially with young people, Mm -hmm. and on the environment, which is something that's so close to my heart. It would depend. Yeah, let's let's see how the first workshop sure. goes, and mm-hmm. if there is uh, interest, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, I'm very happy to develop something else or mm-hmm. a, a, a larger program for this mm-hmm. sort of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So before we end our session, Swilin, do you have any messages to our listeners um, um, regarding the environment issues, or what we need to do, or any, um, especially to writers out there? Well, if you are passionate about any issue mm-hmm. to do with the environment, if you care a lot about, um, you know, stray animals, uh, if you want to do something in your school or in your university, um, go ahead. I think just just do. You know, don't wait for somebody else to start a program or to start a project or to start a blog. Mm-hmm. Write. If you have the ability to write and you feel that you have a voice that... Uh, you, you have something to say mm-hmm. and you want to develop your voice, uh, just go ahead. It doesn't matter. It's not about writing and writing especially. Let me let me focus on writing. It's not about getting a million hits. Right. It's not about going viral. Mm-hmm. If you're a good photographer, it's not about that at all. It's about... Um, Putting your voice, doing something, mm-hmm. um, even if it's uh, you know a, a photograph or Instagram or whatever, right. and, and just sharing it, you know. Mm-hmm. And you can now with social media and with the internet, uh, the barriers to spreading your message are really, really gone, mm-hmm. and you literally have the world there. Uh, how you're going to get heard is another issue, but just put it up, you know, and just do something, and just don't wait. Right. Well, thank you so much for the interview, Sirlin. Don't yeah. forget to participate in her workshop on. 18th of October, which is on Sunday from 9.30 to 12. Yeah. And then it will be at the White Box Publica. So uh, do check the website out and there are a whole list of workshops out there. So do participate and then bring the awareness of the environment. Thank you.